Hi class. We're going to be talking about uh, databases in Chapter 6. Really, data is the foundation of our organization along with our users. Um, so a very important chapter. Um, there's about 30 some slides. I've also posted a chapter of my graduate school database class um, on iLearn. So if you want some more information about databases and data itself and attributes, entities, and such, you can go there. Just for some housekeeping, um, as I made you aware today, excuse me while I fix my glasses, the midterm is due a week from today. March 5th, so it's due March 12th, and I put a study guide together for you all. There'll be a quiz for Chapter 6 and 8 um, when we get back from spring break. Um, I did post a form of questions for the chapter, so let's get working on those. Our Chapter 6 presentation uh, should be uh, sent to me as well. Here we go. What we hope to learn today. What are the problems managing data? We're going to learn about database management systems. We're going to learn some tools for accessing data. We'll look at some tools for data administration and ensuring data quality. We'll also look at some business intelligence and some uh, data modeling all that, things like that, more predictive analysis type things that we do with uh, warehouse data. I asked you all to talk about Brooks Brothers in a forum. We're not going to do a homework assignment. Some important terms to um, look at in the chapter. First, we need to know what a database is. Database is simply a group of related files. A file is a group of records. A record is a group of related fields. A field is a character, word, etc. An entity, we can think of an entity as a noun, a person, place, or thing. An attribute is something that describes the entity, so it's an adjective. And we can think of database structures as being things like you would see in Excel. We have rows and columns, and that's how we organize data and databases as well. And we'll see we'll use something called SQL queries to actually get data that we want out. So this shows our data hierarchy. If we look at the bottom, I'm going to go bottom up instead of top down. The smallest pit piece of data is a bit, a little bit bigger is a byte, and it's really machine language. Zeros and ones, um, and byte, it's a uh, assembly language. Field is actually something that has some kind of meaning. So in this case, it's a course field, so it's IS101. A record now is a little more detailed, a little more um, attributes behind it. So we see we have student ID, course, date, and grade. So you can look at that as something like Gradebook and iLearn. If we look at file, it's a collection of student IDs and their grades, kind of like my view of Gradebook. And databases are where we're going to store data and where we're going to pull data from. So in this case, for the file course, we're getting a student ID, the course ID, date, and grade. We're going to get some stuff from the personal file to do things like what's their email address. So problems with the traditional file environment. But back in the day, we we're going to talk about displaced technologies a bit. We used file cabinets to store files. Now that's the way we would manage data mounds and mounds of paper and folders organized probably by name. So you can see a lot of problems with maybe data redundancy or lost data. It's the same way with how people store things traditionally outside the database world. Files are in different locations, they're managed by different departments. In that case, we may have 
data redundancy, which is duplicated data. We may have anomalies, which are inconsistent data. An example of that would be, say, Maris had a payroll record for me, and they had a record Alexander Macker with all my attributes the same, but I go by Al, and what if they had another record for Al? You can see the problem with inconsistent data. We had lack of flexibility, really no security, and no data sharing in this model. This slide depicts the traditional, traditional file processing system. So we had four departments, manufacturing, sales, human resources, and accounting, all had their own users, users managed by the departments themselves instead of in a directory. You see we have four programs accessing the users and four different sets of files with one master file. So we have duplicated data, we may have inconsistent data, very poor quality. So with poor quality data, we really can't make good sound decisions. So we could be in a, a whole heap of trouble. The next step from the old file cabinet or storing digital files was databases. Database is a central data repository saving location that helps us control redundant data by the introduction of things called keys. A database management system, on the other hand, lets us have a easy to use graphical interface based application where we can manage our data and databases. As the slide shows, it sits between applications and physical files. They separate the logical and physical views. It controls redundancy, eliminates inconsistency, and it allows us to centrally manage our data. I should point out before we look at the human resources database in a little better view, uh, the midterm is simply chapters one through five and chapter seven. So chapter six, which we're doing today, chapter eight I'm probably gonna record today as well, but what we'll typically be doing next week are not included on the midterm, they'll be included in the final. So looking at this slide, we see the cylinder that represents a database. Um, it should be named something, so maybe we would name this employee. So the entity, the noun, would be employee. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything we see under that are its attributes. Employee ID, name, social security number, etc. So the bi-directional arrows from the database to the database management system are its relationship. So database management system puts records into employee ID name and such and it gives information back to views like the benefits view we see above. A relational database is really built on how two-dimensional tables relate to each other. Each table has data and attributes. And it's built up like rows and columns, just like I told you in Excel. Rows are called tuples. There are records for our different entities. Fields are a representation of an attribute for an entity. A key field is one we use to uniquely identify a record. A primary key is a type of key that enforces uniqueness and it's used as a way that we can have relationships from one table to another. A form key is a primary key used in a second table to create a relationship. We'll show some examples. <clears throat> we have two relational database tables here, one called supplier, one called part. So supplier is the entity, part is the entity. The attributes that go uh, across the top row, so supplier number, supplier name, supplier street, city, state, and zip, are all attributes of the entity supplier. Same thing with part, part number, part name, unit price, and supply number. 
So we see supplier number is a primary key. That means there could be one and only one supplier number 8261. If we had another supplier number 8261, our database management system would throw an error and say that the value for a supplier number has to be unique. Now notice supplier number is in the part table as well. There, the same values are present, but now it's a foreign key. The primary key for the part table is part number. So we could pull data with something called a query from both of these tables. We could go select supplier number, name, part name, unit price from supplier comma part where part number is now where supplier number is 844. Now we give us a record for supplier number 844 with the details about 844 and the parts they were trying to sell us. Very powerful way to manage relationships. The SQL programming language is built around 20 or so keywords. In my graduate school class, I will typically have them buy a book called Learn SQL in 10 Minutes. So it's 15, 10 minute lessons on how to use SQL. And some of the commands are select. So if I write a select statement, it gives me all the records that meet my query. A join will combine two tables and I'll be able to get all the resultant data out. And project creates a subset of columns in a table graphically like this. We have three tables, part, supplier, and I'm sorry, two tables. And we're looking to get part number, part name, supplier number, supplier name, etc. So sorry. Let's regroup. So the first purple table is the select part number equal to 137 or 150. And we get the result below. Joined by supplier number means we're making the two tables look like it's one because of supplier number. Primary key in one, form key in the other. What can we do in a DBMS? We can define our data. We can manipulate our data. We can back up and restore our data. We can have a data dictionary, which tells us um, what each data piece is, meaning we define our attributes, we define our relationships, we define our entities. We can have a database schema, which is a, a Google Maps version of our database. We can have a means to get data out of a database, meaning SQL. And we can get reports as well. This is just an example of a data dictionary in Microsoft Access. You'll notice we have field names, the type of data we have, whether it's number, text, some database management systems will let you have a var car, which is a variable character, which is numbers and text, and we describe what the attribute is. This is a SQL query that will give us what we just had. That purple slide. It says select part, part number, part name, supplier number, supplier name from part supplier, or part supplier number equals supplier, supplier number, and part numbers 137 and 150. So we can see here, this is an access query, which lets you do this graphically where you don't need to statement. So we have a relationship here. If you notice between part and supplier, there's a line. 
That's the start of what we call an entity relationship. The infinity symbol means many, and the supplier means one. So in essence, what this relationship means, one supplier has many part numbers, and many part numbers are managed by one supplier. Relationships are always bi-directional. How do we design databases? We first design databases by looking at business processes, and business rules. We really need to know how our end users are supposed to do their job and how they want to have a look at their data. After that, we'll look at building a, a plan, a really a relationship diagram. So from our business rules, we get our entities and our attributes. Then we look at how each table should relate to itself. Then we look to normalize the databases. It means really minimizing redundancies, that's all it is. And we make sure we have referential integrity. So this is an, a normalized relation for the order table. So here we have things that depend on, on something else. We have order number, order date, part number, part name. So order date depends on order number, part number depends on part number. So in this case, we really need more tables to be able to generate relationships better. This unnormalized table won't get it done. We could have a table here for orders with attributes order number and order date, for parts with part number, part name, unit price, part quantity. We can have another one for supplier with all the attributes for supplier. Then we can build relationships from there, set our foreign keys, our primary keys, and the like. We broke it down a little more than I just did in that we can also take order out. So what I normally do with normalized tables, I break the ones that depend on each other, then I look further to that. So I would have gone through a few phases to get to the four tables. First normal form, second normal form, third normal form. Boys cod normal form is a special type of 3NF. So here now we have four tables, supplier with a primary key or supplier number, part with a part number primary key, order number with the order number primary key, and you'll see line has two items that need to be joined together to maintain uniqueness in the line item table. This is called the composite key. The biggest tool that database designers have are entity relationship diagrams. This type of diagram depicts a relationship between one table to another. And it's really used to communicate with end users to make sure that we are going to plan our database around their needs. The particular diagram we see here is in crow's foot notation. The crow foot with the horizontal line in the less than signal indicates many. The two horizontal lines depicts one. In the words you see like provides or is ordered, that's our cardinality, it's how they're related. So we read this like this. One supplier provides many parts. A part is supplied by one supplier. Many parts, sorry. Many parts are ordered. Again, let me back up, sorry. One part is on a line item. A line item can contain many parts. Is not the right way to say out thing, buddy. Sorry. One part is ordered by many line items, meaning we can have a line item with the same part on it many times. However, we can only have one part per line item. And there could be many line items on an order. An order includes many line items. Sorry about that flub, guys. So to show we've watched the chapter uh, six video, 
Let's think of some one-to-many relationships, or even one-to-one -one relationships, or many-to-many. -many. So things like a class can have one professor, but a professor can teach many classes. Okay. A student can take many classes, many classes can be taken by many students. Things like that. So think of some that you see in your everyday life and try to get a relationship one to many, one to one, or many to many. As we've used in technology more and more, and we're storing more than zeros and ones, we've had to come up with a way to store that type of data. Things like social media with its impact on society and us now storing picture files, video files like the one I'm creating today, or videos we create on our smartphones, music files, all led us to look at a different way of storing data. And we do that through things like NoSQL, Hadoop, we call it managing big data. Big providers are Facebook themselves, Amazon Web Services, all provide a better model to handle non-relational databases, unstructured data. Next bullet shows databases in the cloud. 12 years ago, we were trying to build a true web application on the internet at Sincora Guarantee using things we looked at in the cloud chapter like virtual servers. We could never have enough memory for our relational database management systems to have it on a smaller platform or virtual platform. But with so much power today by our outsource providers and cloud providers, we could easily run any um, relational database management system in the cloud. Things like Microsoft SQL, L, Azure, SQL stands for Structured Query Language, are prevalent in managing data on the internet. Big data that we talked about before, massive amounts of unstructured data, very hard to manage. We need new tools to manage this type of data, which we haven't really had until five or 10 years ago. We've all heard business intelligence running a rampant in society today. It's a way to provide information from looking at big data or static data. A data warehouse is simply like a warehouse you would get products from, say, Amazon from. Huge buildings where we have aisles and bins laid out. You may see them like at Lowe's and Home Depot if you've ever been to one of those stores. You can easily find products by knowing aisle number and bin number. Well, Data Warehouse is similar. It stores current data from transaction processing systems and historical data. Once the current data goes into our Data Warehouse, it stays static. So now we can provide things like predictive analysis to determine sales of um, iPhones in the Midwest in October. Data Mart is a subset of a data warehouse. You can look at it kind of like this. We can go up to the stop and shop in Hyde Park and get whatever we want. That's like a data warehouse. A data mart is like the mobile across the street from Marist campus, where we can get a subset of the things we can get at Stop and Shop. Same thing with a data mart. Subset of a data warehouse usually used for an organizational unit. So maybe HR has its own data mart within a bigger data warehouse where they can provide analysis for hiring trends, things like that. Hadoop is simply a database management system for big data. In-memory computing uses our computer's memory we talked about in Chapter 5 for data storage to um, 
quickly return results of things like queries. It helps us render web pages much faster. It helps us make calculations better, better predictive analysis. We can reduce spend hours to seconds, um, but we need top of the line hardware to do so with tons of RAM in it. So the tools we use for um, predictive analysis, that's what we used to call data mining. Um, text mining, web mining, the whole like is how we look at dimensions within a data warehouse. Consolidating, analyzing, and providing access to data to make better decisions. OLAP gives us a three-dimensional view of our data. When I was a graduate student at Marist, I took a data management class where we did a lot of OLAP, a lot of looking at things in dimensions. I found the class very challenging and still today uh, the class I'm most proud of. It made me think outside of the box, made me think in dimensions for the first time. So if we look, viewing data using dimensions, each aspect of information is in a different dimension. An example here, how many washers sold in the east in June compared to other regions? We may see a cube shortly. Here. So it said washers in June, whatever location was at west. So if you look at the cube, it's a three by two cube. We have nuts, bolts, washers, east, west, central, actual project. So if we look at the washers row, we go to west, and now we go over to project it. So it would be a purple cube on the third row in the back of this model. Something we couldn't do without OLAP. We would only get the results of nuts, bolts, washers, screws from east and west. So now we can really see self trends, see where we may have to move washers from the west to the east to anticipate or uh, not to have product on hand to be able to sell to our customers. Data mining now called predictive analysis finds patterns and relationships in data sets. We'll look at things like association sequences, classification, clustering, forecasting, all because of data mining within a data warehouse using OLAP technologies. Text mining extract key elements from large unstructured data sets. I use text mining when doing um, email searches for um, lawsuits. Um, we put in keywords, the keywords are searched through databases, and we pull out results. Web mining is looking at web content, web structure, web usage to determine patterns of people using X website. I talked a bit about databases in the web earlier, and now we really make them available to our customers and partners through that client server model we talked about before web server, application server, database server. We can use a web browser with this type of model, similar interfaces that we're used to within the browsers we use very inexpensive to add that web interface. So we see here we have a client using the internet, hits our web server, hits our app server, hits our database server, hits our database. So if you simply go to maris.edu, why don't you try this while you're watching a lecture? You get a home page. That home page, the structure is stored in HTML on the web server. That HTML calls the application server to connect to our database server, Microsoft Azure, Oracle, things like that, to pull out the data elements we need to populate Marist's homepage. That's how the client server relationship works. Today, in my on campus class, I'll be drawing a diagram of how we're connected to. 
the internet at our homes. I will take a picture of it and upload it into iLearn today. Um, it may be a midterm question, so please take notes of it and I'll provide some narrative around the picture as well. Why do we need an information policy? Why do we need a data policy? It shows what we're going to really do with data. It shows who manages it, who deals with policies and processes, who deals with integrity, who is accountable, um, who administers the data, who maintains it, who backups, who restores, how long do we keep data for. We ensure data quality by, well, frankly, making sure our data is good. Um, we do a data cleansing exercise to make sure we don't have data anomalies, data duplication. Um, yearly, we do a data quality audit. Bad data makes bad decisions. Bad data killed my former company's in quarter guarantee. We were thriving, doing municipal deals for bond insurance left and right. Our stock price was $36 at IPO. It was up to $42 in its heyday. Then we had some bad data that said we would be successful in the mortgage industry. Um, inputting that mortgage data into our book of business killed in court guarantee. So it's very important to make sure your data is good so you can provide proper modeling and forecasting so you don't have a company like Sincora go away. 